I basically want to talk a little bit about my journey of why, after having used everything from Yggdrasil, Caldera, Fedora, SUSE, and a whole bunch of other distributions, of why the system that I'm running this on as of this moment is actually running Windows 10. And so I'm going to be doing this uh, just partly as a thought provoker and partly as an attempt to try and, and uh, I won't say build bridges, Microsoft doesn't need my help and I really don't want their help, but that's not really the point. So I'm sort of going to go into uh, why somebody would do this uh, and what are the trade-offs and what are the benefits? And it's a basically make an informed decision about which is, if this is a good path for you or not. For most people, the answer may be no, and that's fine, but at least be informed. So uh, I don't know if everyone can see my screen. It, it, can everyone see it okay? I'm seeing no. Okay. Okay, so nobody's seeing a black screen with yellow and white. All right, I'm going to have to change this up and change my screen sharing to something a little bit different. And so, all right, at very least I can do this. Okay, is that at least a little better? So you're seeing yep. like you're, you're seeing the the screen, not the presenter screen, but uh, anyway. So um, if this is the best I can do, at least you can see. I mean, I'm here to talk. The slides are basically here to support me. Uh, then I, I don't do slides that you just read your presentation off the slides. So, all right. So um, why am I even doing this? Uh, Personally, I'm not even sure because I'm. this isn't really a source of pride. I'm not here to defend Windows. I'm not here to bash Linux. I've used Linux too long. I work with an organization whose job it is to promote open source. Um, but there's something that just, I guess, snapped a bit. And so I'm trying to offer a little bit of light amongst the heat because a lot of the discussions about, you know, is Windows evil, is Microsoft evil, are these kind of things evil? Um, you know, I, at least for now, I want to try and avoid these kind of dis, uh, that part of the discussion and go into the practicalities of it. Uh, I want to make a point, all my other computers run Linux. I've got two servers in my house. I have, uh, I have a bunch of Raspberry Pis and I have access to a bunch of things and they're all running Linux, but my main desktop is not. So I just wanted to go into why I even did this. And so it's not a matter of drinking the Kool-Aid, but I did drink, I did eat the Kool-Aid powder raw and maybe that's what's got me to the situation. So um, I don't know, but I've been around long enough to hear every year somebody's writing, this is the year of the Linux desktop. And everyone's saying some breakthrough is going to happen. Oh, well, maybe it's Wayland. Well, maybe it's, you know, the gnome folks have actually kissed and made up with each other. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things that are saying, oh, you know, Ubuntu is going to do blah or whoever. There's always some reason that somebody's saying it's going to be the year of the desktop. And I've long since given up and come to the conclusion that it's never going to be the year of the Linux desktop for a couple of reasons. The world of Linux is so big that uh, if you count servers, if you count Android, if you count Chromebooks, if you count Raspberry Pis, you count everything that's out there, you count embedded, you count everything. Linux is one on just about every other platform. And so there seems to be this obsession that because the desktop screen is in front of people's faces, this is the thing that we actually have to win at. And so to me, it's a little bit of wishful thinking. Um, and, and I just wish maybe over the last 25 years, if the Linux world really took this seriously, you know, this could have happened. But the fact is it didn't. And the very last bullet point I have there is 1.8. That is the current market share of Linux on the desktop between Apple, 
and the various versions of Windows that are out there, and a couple of other things. Uh, I had a look and I went back something like 15 years. Uh, Linux has never broken 4% globally of the entire install base of computers that have uh, sat on people's desks. And at a certain point, it, it reached a peak of about 4%, you know, a uh, bunch of years ago. Now it's at 1.8. It hasn't broken two for quite a while. And at a certain point, if you're a vendor and you're building something that's going to support uh, desktop users, are you going to go with, you know, uh, Windows and Apple that between them have 98% or are you going to go with, are you, how much effort are you going to spend on that 1.8%? And being at the bottom of the pie like that really kind of shows after a while. And so after all these years, I'd sort of had enough. I've been fighting with Pulse Audio the better part of a dozen years. Uh, the latest thing is that Pulse Audio insisted that my microphone was my speakers. So that every time I would boot up, it would boot up saying, oh, we want to play your music and sound through your microphone. And even though I would change it, I would set the defaults and I dutifully press save, I boot back up and there it would be back again, thinking that my microphone was the sound thing. How hard is it to do that kind of thing? And I understand that there's a lot of sound devices and there's a lot of things going on. But there's a lot of very different other kind of devices going on. And I just don't get it. You know, other things like, you know, here I am using a, a very, very, um, you know, I'm using a top of the line Logitech webcam that has different kinds of focus, different kinds of zoom, different kinds of effects under Linux. What do I have to use to, to modify, to, to control it? V42L dash control with the absolutely lamest syntax of, of things of you wanna change the focus or you wanna change the zoom or you wanna change the brightness. It's just awful. Sure, I was able to make some scripts and get them to go on boot up. But if I wanted to adjust it, if I wanna have it in daylight or have it in, in, in with the lights on in the room or off, what you have to go through to do that kind of thing. You know, on Windows, they make a great app and you just set a couple of sliders and there you go and you're there. You know, the, the Logic Tech app even allows you to do a dual screen setup where I could have my, I could have my uh, slide show up there and it would show my head at the bottom corner that you may have seen on a lot of podcasts and things like that. Every Logitech webcam that runs under Windows is able to do that out of the box. Under Linux, not there. And so, you know, maybe somebody at the end of this talk is going to tell me either what I was doing wrong or what I didn't find or whatever, but I searched all over the place and the best I could find was some really archaic things. You know, when, when you're working in video and the only control you have is on the command line, something is very weird about that. So I find that Linux on the whole tends to be many years behind the hardware. Something will come out and it'll support the printers of X years ago, and it'll support the, um, the video cards of X years ago, but it's always a kind of step ahead. Why? Because when the vendors come out with the hardware, they're focusing on the 98%. And it's up to the open source world to try and catch up. And it's always a lag. It's always, you know, you're always supporting the last rev of things instead of the current rev. And it's not the fault of the open source world, but it's just the way it is. So if you want to get the latest and greatest of things, um, you know, you're going to have buggier hardware on your video cards, or you're going to have, you know, uh, stuff where the software isn't quite the current version because you're not on the top of the, you're not on the top of the list of the devs that are out there to support the widest possible audience. And so you often have a situation. Uh, anyone here who's been using Skype knows that for the longest time, you know, this, the version of Skype that was on Linux, yeah, it supported it, but it was like three or four or, or sometimes generations behind the Windows version. And people in the Windows version could have access to stuff that you didn't. And it just, um, it drove me, it just drove me crazy. And so, um, and, and then there was more than one or two times where I was trying to change something in, in, in X Windows 
and you know you changed the wrong line in X windows and you're borked and I wasn't even able to get back to a command line. I mean, it really, really screwed up the video on the system so badly that I had to log in from another system through the network to actually even get in. And it, anyway, and then you have some systems where they, they don't even release an official version of the software. I think Spotify is one of those, where by virtue of the fact that the devs in Spotify love Linux, they're making sure that there's a Spotify app for Linux, but it's only as a labor of love and as a skunkware project. It's not officially endorsed. And the moment they have a change of some of these devs and some people come out and come, the people coming in don't have the same love for it, you're at their mercy. It's not an officially endorsed thing. So the company isn't necessarily going to back it up. And I found that there's a couple of, there's a couple of things like that where the, the, um, you know where the where the the software itself is 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 not official. It's it's uh, it's done because the devs love it, and it's great because you know a lot of them are open source lovers as well. But to depend on that for software that you use every day just seems to me to be getting. Uh, you know, I my my tolerance for that kind of thing, I guess, has just been dropping. I think maybe this is also a matter of me just getting old and going into. I don't have time for this crap kind of mode. Uh, whereas I just want to get stuff done. And so what happens is you get more and more frustrated by the stuff, by the kind of frustrations that I ran into. You know, here I am with Pulse Audio after a decade not getting its act together and so on. And so, you know, the, 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 um, the allure of Windows uh, is kind of, in some ways, a little bit compelling. Uh, because it does some things. So for instance, um, if you use Handbrake or you use OpenShot or you use a piece of open source software that does video manipulation, on most, uh, for most of these, the, the Windows version of these apps is actually able to take advantage of the GPU on the system because the drivers that NVIDIA and, and, uh, and not ATI, AMD make for their video cards allows for apps access to the GPU to be able to do all sorts of neat things. On, under Linux, you don't have access to that. Uh, there's a, there, on Handbrake, there's a, there's a flag. Do you want to use the G, do you want to use cycles on the GPU if available? That flag doesn't exist under, Win, under Linux. And so you have the ironic and unfortunate situation that very often open source apps will run better under Windows than under Linux. Uh, my friend Marcel Gagné was the first to discover that as he was doing a whole bunch of tests. And he sort of showed me in the real world about how, you know, how, how can it be that an open source app would run better under Windows than under Linux, but actually doing a lot of real world testing, that's what it turns out to be for a lot of these. And I don't know the guts of why this is happening. I don't know the situation of the complexity of libraries or whatever. There's tech people here that'll run rings around me on that. I can just say at the end of the day, when I'm running an app to do a job under Windows is sometimes slightly and sometimes more than slightly faster than doing the same task on the same open source app on Linux. I finally got to use my scanner. I, I, I I, on, on, on a very, very, um, uh, let's just say I, I was sort of loose with my wallet for a day and I bought something on Indiegogo. I bought a scanner that could scan an entire book within a matter of minutes. It's one of those special scanners where you takes a picture, two pages, you flip the page, click, take the picture, click and go on. And you can literally scan an entire book and it has really, really good OCR in it. And so this is this really appealed to me. I've got a library and the ability to make home copies and digitize some of these, and some of them are out of print. That really appealed to me. The scanner is not and never will be supported under Linux. The software that they're doing, not because this the, the app maker or the scanner maker is evil, it's just they're playing to the 98%, not to the 1.8. And so they're a small startup, um, you know, they're doing, they're funding it through Indiegogo and through Kickstarter, and they're going after where the installed base is. 
So on one hand, I want to yell at them and say, do you have a Linux version? And in fact, at the very beginning during the fundraising campaign, people asked that and they said, we just don't have, we just don't have the horsepower. We don't have the human resources to be able to support the 1.8%. So the choice is at the end of the day, I had to run Windows to be able to use that scanner. And I am, and I'm starting to get used to it, but you know, that's not the, you know, I also have a photo quality scanner that also, you know, I fought a lot with Sane and a lot of the apps that were running under it. They just, some of the advanced stuff, they just don't support. So this is, you know, this is what, this is what it's like on the other side. You're going to give up the purity of being in open source, but you're going to get back the ability to use some of the better tech that's out there in the hardware and the software. It's my opinion, and I guess people can debate this, that I think Microsoft has moved on from the OS wars in that they've, they, you know, they bought GitHub, they've joined Linux Foundation. They're basically saying, we may not make everything in open source, but at least we're happy to coexist. Uh, there's a couple of apps that I've seen, you know, Microsoft Teams and things like this, where they've actually taken an effort to make sure that they do good support of Linux. And, you know, I get it. People still have long memories. And remember when Steve Ballmer was saying that Linux is communism and, uh, and, 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 you know, it was really, really rough, but he's long gone running the Los Angeles Clippers. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, that's the reality to me is that Microsoft, I don't consider them a friend of open source or friend of Linux. But I, there, I don't consider them to be as utterly hostile as they have been in the past. And then finally, they came out with a Windows subsystem for Linux, which might be a good demo on a future day, preferably when we're all back sitting together in a single room at once, where, uh, where an entire desktop session of Linux is running as a virtual window under Windows. Uh, and so it's not, you don't have to install other software. It's a, it's a, it's a virtual, it's a virtualization, virtualization system that literally says you can go from a command line in PowerShell and say, install WSL2, and then it asks you what distribution you want. And so I have a full blown version of Ubuntu that can run under a window on my Microsoft Windows system. So when I need to run Linux, I've got it. My Linux software that runs under that is fully capable of using all the hardware in the system. <coughs> uh, and, uh, you know, there's, there's other things like, so for instance, I have a Linux file server running Samba. My Windows, my Windows desktop works with it a whole lot better than Linux using the SMB clients in terms of the speed of being able to do file transfer from a desktop to a Samba server. So it's not a surprise that Windows able to do SMB better than Linux does, but it's still a practical, it's still a practical thing for me that it's, it, it's there. Um, so there's a number of things. There's also, um, let's see. So, so uh, the other thing that, and, and this was told to me by all sorts of people, is that Windows is a lot more stable than it used to. Uh, in the couple of months that I have been that I have been running this, I've not had a single blue screen of death. I've not had a single freeze. I've had a couple of times where it says I've installed an I'm I've installed an OS upgrade. Would you like to reboot now or reboot later? Uh, but that didn't, you know, I wasn't totally immune from that under Linux either. The cost of a license was $4. And so if you go to Alibaba or AliExpress and you literally do a search on the words Windows key, you will find a whole bunch of different, different uh, stores, storefronts, and they will offer to sell you a, li a license for Windows, a full working key for $4. Now, the, the legality of that, depending on who you ask, is either fully legal or a little shady, but here's how it works. 
uh, most of these most of these storefronts on AliExpress can be traced back to Turkey, and there is a company there that is into PC recycling. And what they do is, when the PC is ready to be recycled, they extract the Windows license of it, toss the hardware, or recycle the hardware, and then try and resell the license. Upon looking a little further into the legalities, uh, what Microsoft says is that retail versions of Windows, the ones that you would buy in a store, are fully transferable as long as they're not on two PCs at the same time. What isn't transferable are the OEM ones. So when Dell ships with one or HP ships with one, or they have the licenses where they're getting it at a discount rate, a real cut rate, um, when they sell it as an OEM product, it's not transferable, but the retail product is. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an expert. This is the best of the research I was able to do. And so when I went and I got this key for, I paid, I think $2.80 on AliExpress. Within an hour of making the purchase, I was emailed the key and instructions on how to use it. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of installing Microsoft, when you do an installation, you can install everything first, but it won't really activate it until you've put in a legal key. And when you put in the key, it phones home and asks Microsoft, is this legit? Is it pirate or something else? I've done this twice and it's accepted the one I bought on AliExpress without any problem both times. So your mileage may vary. I'm just saying that I've had success with being able to buy a Windows license for under three, four dollars Canadian. So what you do is you buy the license from that way, and then you literally go to Microsoft and you download, you download the software onto a USB stick, just like you would load a, a Linux distro. And you can download the full Windows system. It loads on a USB stick. I think it takes a 16 gig stick. And then you boot up your system, you load the software, and then you put in the key. The installation process in some ways has gotten very, very similar to installing your garden variety Linux distro, except that it's asking for the key and they don't give you the source code. So here's, the here's one of the interesting things that I wanna bring to your attention is that there is a really, really good project out there. Um, it is the, the Trinidad and Tobago open source club has been around about as long as GTA LUD. And one of their big projects that they've always been doing is collecting open source apps to run on Windows. Back in the day, they, had, they, they, they were uh, selling and distributing CD-ROMs. Then they increased it to a DVDs full. And now they've just gone online. You can download an ISO image that includes everything that would load onto a USB stick, but, uh, I would suggest just going to the site. Um, it's not the easiest to remember URL, ttcosswin.ttcs.tt, -t. <laughs> uh, but it's worth it. It is a really, really good repository in saying, I need some utilities. Where am I going to find open source, source code available utilities that will run on a Windows system? Uh, the Trinidad and Tobago Computer Society have done a really, really good job of collecting everything from graphics to utilities to productivity to everything. Uh, uh, if, if they don't have something, you should tell them and they'll add it. They're really, really good about it. And they've been doing this for a long time. So I'd highly recommend it that whether or not you're switching to, to a Windows system like me, or if you've always had to run on a Linux, on a Windows system because of work or other things, if you're still a fan of open source software, there's some really, really good stuff out there. You know, using uh, Inkscape instead of Illustrator, using GIMP instead of Photoshop, these are all still fantastic choices. They're all still fantastic options. And they're all out there and they run really, really well under Windows as well. So you can, have a you can have a system, and I'd say mine is very close to that, where at, you know, at least four fifths of the software that you're running are open source. And they're running on, uh, you know, the, the least open source part of your, of your rig is actually the operating system. And so I need to go through, what do I miss when I did the switch? What, what, are, what are, you know, 
What do I wish I could have brought over with me that I wasn't able to? Uh, the biggest thing is a decent file explorer. I was a really big fan of the Dolphin File Explorer under KDE. It had dual Windows facilities. It had some very, very good things that you could do with it that I just don't find are matched by the conventional stuff that comes with Windows. Uh, I'm told there's a couple of decent file explorers once. There's a couple of different pieces of software called Commander that claim to be really good file explorers under Windows. I haven't tested them yet. I am going to be putting some of them through the ringer, so I may be able to change my mind at some point. But right now, I haven't found anything in Windows world that is anywhere as good as, as, as Dolphin or, or Nautilus or some of the open source uh, file managers that worked under Linux. Package management. Uh, both RPMs and dpackage are miles ahead of anything right now under Windows. Uh, they've tried to do some things like that by having a Windows store that looks a little bit like, you know, and, uh, Google Play on Android or the Apple Store or whatever. It's bogus. It's, it's crap. It's not very good at all. So very often what you're going to do is the, the apps, like if you're running, uh, if you're running Firefox or you're running uh, some of the core apps, uh, very often they'll check for their own updates, then they'll phone home and they'll check for their own up updates and they'll install it that way. But uh, I'd say less than half of my apps and maybe uh, a quarter of my really useful apps are actually managed through the, the Microsoft App Store. Um, Microsoft's update system itself is actually not that bad in terms of doing auto updating uh, and uh, you know, you get to pick the time when it does the updates and things like that, but that's only for the operating system itself. You know, the idea of doing an, uh, you know, apt upgrade and, uh, um, sorry, apt update and apt upgrade, you know, the, the, the simplicity of doing that kind of thing. There's nothing like that on Windows. I'd say that's my biggest, my biggest thing that I miss here. Uh, next to the concept of OS privacy. Uh, Microsoft Windows does phone home in a way that Linux and open source operating systems do not. There's ways that you can mitigate and minimize the risk. So for instance, uh, I do not have Cortana on here. I've tried to flick all the privacy switches in a way that it's not getting more ad you know, information on me and it doesn't give me ads tuned to my liking and things like that. Um, you know, is it still phoning home? Yes, hopefully with as a minimum amount of information as possible. But then again, I've got an Android phone and to a certain extent, I've already given up some of that to, to Google instead of Microsoft. Um, but yeah, if I had an opportunity, I would try and do what I could to get back OS privacy. Obviously I'm making a personal trade-off that having Windows phone home to Microsoft is not damaging enough to me that I would uh, that I would uh, go back to Linux, but I might. I mean, if it turns out that there's some really nasty security breach or whatever, I could go back at any time. And there's other, you know, obviously all the trade-offs I've just told you about over the last little while are still going to be there. But you know, security does matter. I guess the question of it is, and privacy does matter. I guess the issue is how much. Uh, there's some system tools, you know, the standard stuff that you get that if you're on a Linux system, you just, you know, you, know, you just use almost as force of habit, you know, find awk, uh, du, things like that. And maybe they have their equivalents on a Windows system. Uh, I'm, it, it's possible, quite possibly they, they exist. I just haven't found them yet. And, uh, and so as of right now, I, I still miss them. And what do I miss? I miss, you know, it being cute. Right now, Windows is, is big and bloated. But then again, my last Linux system was pretty big and bloated too. Um, you know, the moment that a Raspberry Pi comes out and it can take an M.2 card and it gets a little bit more horsepower than it is, you know, it might, it might become worthwhile to be a desktop of choice. I'm really hoping that will happen. I don't think it's there yet, but it's really, really close. And, you know, I've already had some of the emotional retorts of, you know, how could you do this? You've been working in open source. You work for an organization that has Linux in its name. You exist to support the growth of open source. How could you do such a traitorous thing? 
And you and there's also been all sorts of other stories. Uh, Jim Zemlin, the uh, uh, the head of Linux Foundation, was uh, you know uh, was outed by actually shown to be using a Macintosh uh, when somebody spotted him on a flight. You know that he was dared to use a, a Mac laptop instead of a Linux laptop. And there were certain people that just pilloried him for it without knowing if there was any backstory, if there were any apps that he needed to use that couldn't. But there's a lot of people that get very, very emotional about this. So I want to make it clear, this is something I did not want to do. If uh, Linux did not give me the grief that it did that I described previously, I wouldn't do it. And maybe if somebody, if it comes back, you know, if 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 Wayland is the unicorn that um, that that everyone's saying it is, and it'll fix all sorts of video problems, then that's going to be fantastic. Uh, I'd go back to KDE in a heartbeat. Uh, I'm very happy with it, but I'm simply tired of the sacrifices. I'm tired of people saying, "Well, yeah, you got to stay pure with open source, and you got to stay pure with Linux, and even if it means you don't have the newest apps, or and even if it means you can't run the software, the, the hardware you want to." At a certain point, and maybe this is just me getting old, I have less and less patience for that kind of thing of people telling me why well, I need to make sacrifices for a certain kind of philosophical purity. I'm running open source extra everywhere else. And open source is running everywhere else. Open source is in the cloud. It's on mobile. It's on Chromebooks. It's everywhere else. I really don't understand why people get in such a knot, why this particular portion of the space, the consumer desktop, um, which Linux may never, ever take over, why this becomes such an emotional flashpoint of why, why haven't we won there too? There's all sorts of battles that open source has won. Maybe this one, it just never will. And so you can either keep fighting it or um, relax. And that's it. So uh, I saw uh, Ron put in, a, has suggested to me that there's a company called ViewSkin is good at supporting scanners under Linux. Uh, and I, I have no doubt uh, you know, there's some there's some hardware that's out there and that I was not totally aware. In this particular case, there was this there was a function specific scanner, the kind of scanner that could do a book in five minutes and digitize it and come with uh, OCR. The frustration was, I wanted to use a scanner like this, and they didn't give a second thought to a Linux or open source driver. So the choice is sacrifice, do without or figure out a way that you had to make a switch. And yes, I've tried wine and stuff like that before, and no, but anyway. So I will, uh, uh, Scott, I'll hand it over to you. I'm open for Q and A and I'll take whatever you, you throw at me. Yep, I see one hand raised from Tori. Uh, so uh, Tori, go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks for the, that awesome presentation, Evan. I can really relate to the lack of a good find alternative on Windows. I just started a new job and I'm like, I gotta search all these directories. How do I do this? This is bullshit. Anyways, um, I had a really quick question. You mentioned a Linux distribution at the beginning of your presentation that sounded like Ingersoll or something to that effect. Yggdrasil, Y-G-G-D-R-A-S-I-L, I think it's spelled. It's one of the, uh, there we go, this, Stuart just did it. It's one of the very first Linux distributions. And, uh, you know, before there was package management, I think it was based on Slackware. And so packages were done on gzip files and things like that. And uh, it, it, was, it was one of the nicest early, early, early versions of open source. I mean, this is when, uh, when, when Red Hat and Caldera were, were still getting their financing, uh, you know, uh, and, and stuff was very, very much in sort of uh, Wild West pioneer days. Uh, that was one of them. Uh, their mascot was like a ball with legs and a shield and a, and a sword, if I remember correctly. Um, but I'm really, really dating myself by answering that question. Perfect. Thank you for the info. Anything else? Oh, this is far kinder than I expected. 
I got to say, I, 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 I have taken some, uh, some online abuse, not all of it well-natured um, for, for, for doing this. And there definitely are some people out there that think that a move like this is, uh, is somewhat traitorous to the cause. And I'm now to the point in saying, whatever, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I'm, I'm, I'm there, there's still, there's still fights to be had to bring open source to, into the data center, into embedded, into all sorts of things. It's just the fight to insist that every desktop on every desk have it is almost not worth the while to me. Um, you know, it's running the cloud, it's running embedded, it's running robotics, it's running Chromebooks, which are now starting to take over the classroom. Um, and so there's so many wins that are happening uh, that, that uh, for people that say, if, if it's not absolute, then it's not anything. I, I've got very little patience for that. Well, I'll ask a question. I tried raising my hand, but that didn't work. Um, first, a speech. <laughs> of course, you should use what works for you. Okay. But sometimes there are consequences. So it's worth paying attention to the consequences. Um, but it, we're all in this for us in some ways, right? Just we get to define who us is. In, in my experience, I use clearly a completely different, have a completely different set of tasks from Evan because I find the opposite. Um, I, as far as uh, Pulse Audio goes, I don't have any trouble with it. I don't try much. The people who don't try much are the ones that get into trouble because they don't know what to do when they want to do something tricky. By they, I mean me. But I haven't had trouble with audio with all these different video conferencing things that I'd never used until the pandemic came up. That shows how I'm a newbie. If I were making, um, you know, videos for TikTok, I guess that's where I aim for, um, all my dance moves and so on, I, of course, would have to become an expert in, in video and uh, audio. And maybe I would run into the problems that you're talking about. But the little bit of stuff I do, I don't run into those problems. Maybe I would have two years ago and three years ago. I didn't try it. So Pulse Audio works fine for me. And it's possible because I'm using a distro uh, for whom, uh, well, the, the sponsor pays for Pulse Audio's development mostly. So that could be a reason. So you've mentioned several times your Pulse Audio woes in you know, previous nights, not just this one. So I, I imagine I'm for sure they're real. It's just I don't experience them. So it's, it's like blind people and the elephant. We see different things. Um, OK, about scanners, I have great luck with scanners on Linux. But maybe it's because I'm careful when I buy them. Um, I haven't tried to buy a book scanner, but and, and that's a narrow field. The ones I knew about were sort of homemade by recipes from archive.org. And I assume that they work on anything because those guys tend to like open source, but I never tried. Um, oh, they got wonderful rigs that take dual, you know, dual Canon cameras pointing down at opposite sides of the page or whatever. Some of those rigs are absolutely wonderful. The software that runs them is open source. And I don't have $2,000 for that rig. Yeah. So what did your rig cost, if I may ask? Uh, it was a total, I think, uh, it was about, I think, 250 bucks for the scanner yeah, and the OCR software. I would be tempted to buy that. Anyway, um, so I don't have any scanner trouble. Oh, except for one weird thing. The Fujitsu scanner only works when it's plugged into USB 2, not into USB 3 port on the computer. No idea why. Um, and anyway, so I have that problem, I have to admit. Um, as far as software I run, almost all of it's open source by choice. 
the, ex the only time that in this household we run stuff on Windows is tax software. Now we could run stuff on Linux if we trusted the cloud because there are all kinds of tax programs that run in the cloud, but I don't want that for privacy reasons. So we use Windows for that once a year. And I actually, I must have OCD or something. I, I, when I get a machine with Windows, I don't wipe it. I install Linux beside it. And pretty much the only time I use Windows, which is really silly, is to do Windows updates. And I have had no end of problems doing Windows updates. The, the system gets itself into a corner and gives me a hex code and expects me to fix it. And when I type that hex code into Google, I find a hundred different people have hit this problem and get different bizarre non-solutions. So it's, it's users helping users, but without the advantage of being able to look at the source to figure out if what they're saying makes any sense. So I've gotten into terrible trouble a number of times. And in the end, I usually end up reinstalling. But that's not terrible with Windows. As you say, reinstalling Windows isn't a bad job. In fact, I think window, reinstalling Windows is faster than turning on a Windows machine for the first time. It's slower than installing Windows, if I remember correctly. Um, anyway, so about drivers. Well, I think one of the really sore spots in Linux is NVIDIA drivers. Because if you don't use the proprietary drivers and you have a modern NVIDIA card, it's just not going to work very well because NVIDIA has not disclosed how to do clocking and power management in the recent generations. So Nouveau can't handle it. Last I checked. I only check every few years, but. You're right. So, I, gave, I gave up on an NVIDIA card and swapped it out and had to put in an inferior AMD card uh, for the same money. And, you know, again, we're talking sacrifices. Some people are are okay with limiting their choices to only half the video card market. Some don't. My favorite choice is Intel, actually. Don't pay for a video card. I don't need one. Try gaming on it. I, why? I don't game. See, I told you we don't do overlapping things. No, I'm serious. If you want a game, it's, I think, from what I hear, you're a bit foolish to tr try and do it in Linux. Not foolish. Quixotic. How about that? Quixotic. Does that make sense? Yeah. You, you, you can run Steam on Linux, but why? Yeah. So not all games work, and not all games that work work well, as I understand it. But what would I know? I never run games. The closest I would run to games would be something on Android, and I don't even do that. Um, anyway, so again, it depends. Each person is in a different world and different experience. So mm -hmm. what I'm not going to contradict anything you say. I'm going to say it doesn't apply to my experience. It's quite a yeah. different thing. And, and if uh, and maybe I sh maybe my first slide should bit have just been the letters, you know, why MMV? Because the situation is going to be different for, for different people. If you're coding, Nothing I said is going to be is going to is going to sink. You know the 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 amount of software development tools under Linux and open source, I think is is going to be better than the same set for for Windows, uh, especially if you're doing system level stuff, database level stuff, anything like that. Um, you know everything is suitable for purpose, and uh, you know if you're doing any kind of server work. I wouldn't use a Windows system in a moment. Uh, if I didn't have to rely on a graphic interface, I wouldn't use a Windows system ever. Uh, it's just that particular strength. That's why I'm saying on a server, on a Raspberry Pi, on devices like that, there's no question that 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 Linux is the answer, and 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 
windows and everything else is far, far, far distant as much as they want to do Azure and all that kind of stuff. I don't so even the, think it's a race. The reason I think Linux is quite useful to me on a desktop is it, the random little jobs I do are mostly done in a browser. And the Linux browsers are good enough for me. They're not very different from the Windows browsers. Uh, I mean, I don't get edge. <laughs> Who cares, right? Um, so actually you can, I believe Microsoft does make edge for Linux. Which edge, the new one, the new, the, the Chromium based one. Yeah. I didn't hear that. Oh, one other thing. If you code, apparently lots of people like VS code, even on Linux, by the way, I, I haven't installed, but I haven't used it. So Microsoft is providing that to the Linux world. Just fascinating. The other thing that I feel occasional twinges about is for business purposes, I get office documents and LibreOffice is 99.4% compatible, but you don't really want to fight those fights sometimes. Like I'm going, office. I'm fighting, I'm fighting one of those fights right now. I'm on deadline to submit a, to submit a proposal to the government of Canada. And in order to do that, you need to fill out their forms and they're done on a version of a PDF that is only usable by the official Adobe reader. Can't open in Chrome, can't open in Firefox, can't open in any of the open source readers, requires Acrobat to be downloaded, to be able to fill in their forms and use their goofy logic and that kind of thing. And the Adobe Reader is not that good under Linux. And so it's the kind of thing that this forces you to go there, that forces you to do that, forces you to do that. And before you know it, you've had to load Windows. Is there a current Adobe Reader for Linux? There has been one. I don't know if it's current. Thankfully, this is not my headache tonight. Right, because that's a fascinating example. Adobe promised, for instance, their um, ebook reading software would be on Linux and they never delivered it. This is an old story now, but I have a, a long memory. And do, with all due respect, we do have another question on deck. Sure. Okay. Um, Peter in the chat asked uh, about your experience with WS2 and graphical apps running from the Linux side. Um, Although I'm not running it right now, I have been able to run a full version of GNOME on top of Ubuntu. Uh, I, as of this moment, I'm not sure if they support Kubuntu, which would have been my choice, but running standard Ubuntu with the GNOME interface on top of that, I've been able to do it just as a regular window on my, on my window system. So um, it would run, uh, I, I didn't test it, I didn't stress test it very much, but it ran GNOME, it ran Nautilus, it ran a number of the basic apps that I expected to find there under Linux. Uh, I did sort of the nickel tour, took about an hour to look around. Um, everything worked, nothing broke. And it, it also updated using dpackage and all the tools I expected to find there. No surprises, it was as if, if I'd taken that window and expanded it full screen, I would have been right at home like I was on a Linux desktop. So I didn't find, find that I was losing anything. Uh, and so if there was an app that, that would run better under Linux or ran only under Linux, um, I'd have no problems with it by, by being able to run it there. Uh, they've also provided a very interesting uh, program called Terminal in which, you know, uh, just like how you would have a, 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 win, a terminal that would uh, give you a command line from a GUI and you know it's tabbed so you can have multiple sessions open at once. On the Windows Terminal one, you can have one session open uh, of PowerShell and right next to it is an X term that will give you a dollar sign that will let you log in using SSH into anything else and so on. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting how you've got a single program that can have in multiple tabs go from PowerShell to the regular Windows command line to give you, giving you a, a Linux prompt. I don't even think you have to install Windows subset in order to get that.
Oh, so Stuart confirms there is no Adobe Reader for Linux. Well, then that makes it a no-brainer if you want to uh, submit uh, submit proposals to the government of Canada. Unfortunately, uh, that part of the Open Government Initiative missed them. Yeah, that those that particular technology I think only runs under the Windows version of uh, Adobe Reader, not even on the Mac version. It's a very special set of technology they've put up with, and the Canadian government uses it almost entirely exclusively. So you're stuck with Windows, and this is one that you cannot. Well, there is a reader that will do it, but it is not reliable. But no, you have to use Adobe. Sorry. I don't know. Are there any other questions in the chat? I didn't. Uh, some good comments from Seneca, um, but uh, um, I, today I learned about Apple AirScan, but uh, I don't know if any other questions on Evan's talk. I mean, my experience of Windows installing it wasn't that great, and WSL2 was not that great, but I have to use it for one thing, so I have a machine that runs Windows now. Um, um, what I had to do, Stuart, was... Um, at least when I did the install, and I'd say this was in January or January, February or so, is that you had to you had to be part of the you know the I'm going to get my up my Windows uh, OS. I'm going to get the experimental version. I forget what they call it, but you join this pseudo club or whatever that gives you access to early releases of Windows updates. And they said, in order to be able to run WSL2 properly, you had to be at this level of Windows, which back, which back in January, February was something that you needed to be part of this early release group to be able to get. Now it's part of the standard release. And so it's not a big deal anymore. And so they've significantly uh, cleaned up the methods for installing WSL2 uh, on, on, on Windows, and that's cleaned up significantly in like just the last month or two. Okay, my install was last week, and I had that same problem. Uh, did you have, did, were you in that sort of advanced uh, Not initially, Windows? and it took, I had to do it, and it took me overnight to do it, so it was not, not really a fun process. Um, I got there, I got there, including installing the new terminal, but no, it, it was not a straightforward thing. I don't have graphical stuff yet. I've used it with um, uh, X server before, but I didn't think it was like a graphical native client. Um, anyway, uh, there was a, something in the chat. Um, nope. So no, no other questions. Um, I think we have a lightning talk. Scott, are you? Um, around to do that because I don't know what the schedule of lightning talks is. All right. So um, thanks a lot, everybody, and uh, enjoy the lightning talks. Thank you, Evan. Thank you so much.